We are in, the, in a sermon series on rediscovering joy through the book of Philippians in the New Testament. And we're going to be looking at the second uh, portion of the third chapter. We've been journeying through the book. And I've requested Joshua to read out uh, the passage uh, for, the, for, for this morning. Uh, it's Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 to 21. It's there for us on, on the screen. Over to Joshua. Philippians 3, 12 to 21. Not that I have already obtained this, or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus had made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the price of the upward call of God, in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if anything you and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom for, for many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemy, enemies of the cross as Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and their, they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body, by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. May God add his blessings to the reading. Amen. Amen. At New City, we delight in reading through, meditating through, and preaching through God's word, which is why we quite often uh, pick up books of the Bible and kind of preach through those books. Uh, and so here we are in, in the ninth sermon in a series on Rediscovering Joy. Through the book of Philippians, we are moving towards the end of the series. And uh, we'll most likely close the series with a couple more sermons. Uh, preparing and, and, and preaching these sermons is it's kind of what a mini revival, a mini revival of joy in my own heart. And I hope it's been a blessing uh, for all of you too. Last week, we began uh, looking at chapter three and we saw that legalism or trying to please God by merely obeying rules is a joy killer. Today, in the passage that we just read, Paul wants us, the Apostle Paul wrote this letter, Paul wants us of a second joy killer. And, and what is this second joy killer? It's there in verses 18 and 19 for us. For many for many of whom I have often told you and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. That's verse 18. And verse 19, their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. And they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. Their God is their belly. Their God is their belly. Paul is warning us that if we allow our appetites to become our God, if we allow our appetites to rule us, we will lose out on real joy in our lives. And no, Paul is not talking just about food. He's talking about all appetites. And I call this licentiousness or living only for the pleasure of our sinful desires. A licentiousness is being enslaved to or giving in and indulging in all of our sinful desires. And licentiousness is a joy killer. Before I, I dive into this, I want to just step back and, and give you just a quick big picture overview of uh, chapter three. And, and it's going to be really helpful. If you remember verse one of this chapter with which we started off last week, uh, was a call to rejoice. Verse 1, finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. 
to write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. So Paul is calling people to rejoice. And he follows that call to rejoice with two warnings. Two things that Paul says could take away the joy from our lives. The first warning we saw last week is that legalism is the first joy killer. Obeying rules just for the sake of the rules. The heart's not really in it. Or trying to please God by obeying rules. That's legalism. The second joy killer is, is licentiousness. That's what we're going to be looking at. A loving our, our appetites to rule us, to, to reign over us. And I wanted us to have that big picture of uh, chapter three as we, as we move it. All that said, I want to draw two things for us uh, from this passage. The curse of our sinful appetites and the redemption of our appetites. Two things, the curse of our sinful appetites and the redemption of our appetites. And let's start with the first thing, the curse of our sinful appetites. Look at verse 18 and 19 again. Uh, 19 especially. The end is destruction. Their God is their belly. They glory in their shame with mindset on earthly things. Their God is their belly. Paul uses this very helpful phrase to describe licentiousness. Their God is their belly. They worship their appetites. They live for their appetites. They find their meaning and significance in their appetites. Truth be told, appetites in themselves are not bad or wrong. All the appetites we have were originally good and beautiful, and it was God who created them. God created the belly and God created tasty and delicious food for the belly. So the belly is not bad or delicious food is not bad. Appetites in themselves are not bad. Uh, the enemy, Satan, he cannot create anything. He, he cannot create a pleasure that, that is apart from God. He can only pervert things that God has already created. So every appetite is good and, and godly. But making our appetites our God and worshipping our appetites or being ruled by their appetites, whatever it is, whether it's appetite for food, whether it's appetite for sex, whether it's appetite for power, whatever it is, being ruled by these appetites is bad. It is very bad. So the appetite for food, the thirst for romance and sex, the appetite for meaning, value, worth, and significance. None of these are bad. But if we become enslaved to and worship and be reigned by, be controlled by any of these appetites, we lose out real joy. I think we all get this to some extent. So that's not what I'm going to really labor on. What I would like to focus on is how do we end up making our bellies our gods? How do we come to a place where, where we find that we are enslaved to our appetites? How do we end up in that dark place in our lives where we, we are actually controlled by our appetites and we have no control? Things that we hate, we do not want to do, we end up doing. How do we come to that place of darkness? And that's what I would really like to labor on. Allow me to start off by saying something that might surprise you. I'm going to unpack this. Any pleasure becomes our God, not when we enjoy it to the full, which is God's design, but when we enjoy it less, which is the devil's rules. Any pleasure becomes our God, not when we enjoy it to the full, but when we actually enjoy it less than God's design for it. This might surprise you. Give me a few minutes. I'm going to spend a few minutes unpacking this. And I'm going to unpack this using romance and sex and sexuality as an example. God created sexuality. Sexuality, sexual pleasure is God's creation. It is his idea. Human beings, I can assure you, 
did not come up with it. Do you think God created a hundred percent capacity to enjoy sexuality, but gives us only 30% opportunity to enjoy it? Do you think that's God's original plan that he would give us X amount of capacity to enjoy sexual pleasure, good godly sexual pleasure, but, but he would only give us 30% opportunity. And that would make God a sadist to give us something, but, but not allow us to enjoy it. That's not in the character of God. He is a good God. He gives us good gifts and he delights when he sees his children enjoying the good gifts he has given us. So we can assume and draw the inference that God created sexuality for us to enjoy it fully. Now the problem, the problem is that the present culture's definition uh, of full enjoyment of sexual and romantic pleasure is very different from God's definition of full enjoyment of these. They're very, very different. God knows that, that we can enjoy 100% sexual and romantic joy only within the covenant of marriage. But the culture around us believes that marriage uh, limits enjoyment. Oh, I don't want to get into the covenant of marriage, but why should I not have the, yeah, why should I not have, uh, why should I not enjoy my sexuality? I, I don't want the covenant. I don't want the commitment of marriage. That's what culture tells us. And the culture uh, around us encourages us and even presents us with opportunities to have sex before marriage or sex outside of marriage. And these opportunities are getting more and more sophisticated and more and more freely available. So which of this is true and, and, and why? It's a question we must answer in our culture. And uh, I'd like to take a shot at answering this. Think of sexuality as a flowing river. Visualize a river, the best river that you've seen. Think of sexuality as a flowing river. The river flows stronger, faster, and with greater intensity when the banks of the river are narrow. The moment you, moment you widen the banks of the river, the flow of the water reduces. And if the banks of the river broaden out too much, the force of the river is totally spent. The river doesn't flow anymore. It becomes still and it stinks. Now imagine a mountain range on either side of the bank of a river that channelizes the flow of the river in a narrow channel. Think of this. If you've been to whitewater rafting, uh, you, you, you'll probably notice the, the force of the water is fastest when the banks are, are, are narrower. Within this narrow channel between the two mountains, the water roars in this channel. The current is strong. The flow is fast. Marriage is like the mountains that channelizes the river of our sexuality for the greatest possible God-designed pleasure. The pleasures of the goodness and pleasures of, of sex are heightened and not lessened in, within the proper godly covenant of marriage between a man and a woman. And like the mountains that narrow the banks and, and make the river flow faster, marriage channelizes the gift of sexuality that God has given us for, for maximum enjoyment. But imagine the banks widen out. Imagine the mountains are gone. The boundaries are gone and there's nothing to hold the water. If there's nothing to channelize the flow of water, and if everything opens out, the water is not going to flow. The river is going to lo lose all its power. It's going to lose all its vitality. It's going to lose all its joy. It's going to be spent and, and wasted. So similarly, take away the God-created institution of marriage and, and, and bring in things like Tinder or, or whatever apps people use these days to get easy sex and easy romance, the river of sexuality loses its strength. It is wasted. It does not satisfy us. 
when a pleasure we seek, when a pleasure we crave for fails to satisfy us, what do we do? Think about it. When a pleasure that we long for, that we crave for, fails to satisfy us, what do we do? We crave for it more. And so the more we seek sexual and romantic pleasure before or outside marriage, the less joyful it becomes. Sex outside of marriage eventually is going to make one feel cheap and used. A commodity that's used for a while, whose utility values for it is, is there for a while, and after that, it's just thrown. Sex is not, not something just about our bodies. You know it. Sex matters to the soul. Male or female, we cannot divorce sexuality from our soul. We cannot divorce our sexuality from our birth, who we are. And so, Sex outside of marriage makes us feel cheap, makes us feel like a commodity used when needed and thrown when not needed. And keep doing it again and again, sex outside marriage or sex before marriage will leave us with an ever increasing craving for an ever decreasing pleasure. An ever increasing craving for an ever decreasing pleasure. Do you know what happens when we begin to feel an ever-increasing craving for an ever-decreasing pleasure? We become addicted. We become enslaved to that pleasure. That pleasure becomes our God. We want it, but we can't get it enough. And we keep trying, 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 wanting it more and more, but we never seem to even be able to get it enough. It begins to rule us. It enslaves us. We spend all our energies chasing it, but it never satisfy us, satisfies us. This is how people get addicted to pornography. Pleasure has become our God when we feel an ever-increasing craving for an ever-decreasing pleasure. Pleasure has become our God when we feel an ever-increasing craving for an ever-decreasing pleasure. Which is why I said any pleasure that become, any pleasure becomes a God, not when we enjoy it to the fullest, which is according to God's design, but we enjoy it less, which is the devil's rules. So using this, this, this example of sexuality, when we enjoy God-given sexuality within the covenant of marriage, we can enjoy it to the fullest. This is where the river of sexuality flows at its fastest. We can enjoy it to the fullest and it leaves us content and fulfilled and satisfied. And more importantly, it leaves us feeling valued. But if we start tasting sex before or outside marriage, it leaves us less and less satisfied. So we crave for it more and more. Not just the, the physical aspect of sexuality, deep inside what drives us towards sexuality, what drives every human being, male or female, towards sexuality, is a deep longing for intimacy. To find someone who would say, I love you. That's, that's what really drives our sexuality. And if we experience sex without that commitment of love, without that absolute commitment of love in the covenant of marriage, it's going to leave us feeling cheap and used. And so we begin to enjoy sexuality less than what God intended. And this is how our belly ends up becoming a God. This is how we turn good and godly appetites into sinful ones, not by enjoying it more, not by enjoying it to God's full plan, but by enjoying it less, by perverting it to be something less than what God intended to be. Eventually, we become enslaved. This is true of romance. Too. It's not just sexuality. Uh, it's true of, of, you know, having five, six, Romantic flings is going to leave you 
ever unsatisfied with any romance in your lives. Just, just, just for that momentary high of, of a flirtation or just for a momentary high of a, of, of a few dates with, with absolutely no intention of marriage or absolutely no interest in marriage, but just the feeling of, oh, somebody is, uh, somebody is you know, attracted to me. Just to live for that momentary feeling without, last, without moving towards a lasting covenant or commitment is going to leave us feeling the same way. And so fake and, and easy uh, uh, romance, the fake and easy romance of casual dating without any interest or commitment to marriage is going to make you value yourself less. It's going to make you respect yourself less. You're going to lose our sense of value and worth, our own sense of inner beauty. This is true of pornography too. I, I know I've used sexuality as one example of licentiousness or making our belly a god because it is a serious concern in the culture we live in. This is not the only concern in the culture we live in. And, and so the same principle plays out in different areas. Let me take a moment to look at social media as an example. Same principle. Um, Social media is built on the God-given gift and appetite of human curiosity. We love to know things around us. And the entire social media business model, uh, who founded it, all the people who founded it, somehow they, they tapped into this God-given human desire of, of curiosity. And so a, a reasonable amount of time spent on social media is great. It's, it's us exercising this God-given gift and enjoying this God-given gift of curiosity by, by looking at, you know, scrolling through our, our feed and, and looking at what's happening around us, knowing what's happening in different people's lives. And, and that's good. A reasonable amount of spent, time spent. But if you're spending five to six hours a day and if you're looking at social media 40 to 50 to 80 times a day, this information overload is going to fry our brains and severely restrict our ability to focus on anything. The more frequently we look, the more frequently we get this, we, we, we just overload our minds with, with unnecessary content. We are just going to be in a state of perpetual distraction. If you're using an iPhone, there's a feature called uh, screen time. And to my utter horror, when I checked my screen time yesterday, I saw that I had picked up my iPhone 170 times a day. That's, that's a kind of average, 170 times a day. And I have no recollection of picking up my phone that many times. No wonder I'm struggling to focus. You see, God puts boundaries not to steal away the pleasure he's given us to enjoy. He's given all good boundaries so that we can enjoy the pleasures he has given us, he has created to the fullest. Uh, when I saw that I picked up my phone 170 times, and when I read this passage, I got really scared. You know, we all take our social media addiction so lightly. Paul says that if our God uh, has made, we have made a uh, our bellies to be our gods, if we have allowed our appetites to become our gods, if we have gotten addicted to anything, Paul is saying in this passage that we are walking as enemies of the cross. Those are some strong words. Look at verse 18. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross. So anyone who has made their belly their God, walks as an enemy of the cross of Christ. That is pretty scary. Scary enough for me not to want to pick up my phone more than maybe 25 times a day. At the most. But how do we break this? How do we break this ever-increasing craving for an ever decreasing pleasure. This is true of buckaries. This is true of social media. This is true of sexuality. This is true of anything. 
How do we break this ever-increasing craving for an ever-decreasing pleasure? How do we stop making our bellies our God? That's the second thing I want to draw for us, the redemption of our appetites, the redemption of our appetites. It's there in the passage. Look at verses 20 and 21. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself. Paul is doing something really interesting here. He is reminding us that our salvation in Christ is not a mere ethereal or spiritual salvation. Paul is reminding us that our salvation is also a physical salvation. He's calling us to see also the physicality of our salvation. The Lord Jesus, when he comes again, will transform our lowly body, physical body, to be like his glorious body. Physical bodies do not get excluded or left behind when we move into eternal life with Jesus. Our bodies are included in God's salvation plan. Let me show you how integral the physicality of our bodies are in God's salvation plan. First, when Christ became a man, he bore the punishment for our sins on his body. Because Christ bore the punishment of our sins on his body, the penalty of our sins is gone. The Bible calls this justification. Jesus, Christ Jesus, King Jesus, who gave up the glorious pleasure of heaven and he lived in the mud and the crime of earth, suffering in an earthly body so that we who have sinned and rebelled and fallen could be forgiven and one day experience the eternal pleasures that are at the right hand of God's presence in heaven. Second, because we are justified, the Holy Spirit comes and lives in our body. Our bodies house and, and, and hold the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit resides in our body. Our bodies become temple, become the temples in which God's Holy Spirit resides. And because God's Holy Spirit lives in our body, we experience that our power over sin is increasing. Our power over sin is increasing and sin's power over us is declining. The Bible calls this sanctification. And third, when Christ comes again, our lowly bodies will be made like his glorious body and the very presence of sin will depart from us. We will become incapable of sinning. We will experience absolutely no desire whatsoever to, to indulge or give in to any sin. Bible calls this glorification. So the human body is very much a part of every step of God's salvation plan. Do you grasp the full implications of this? Let's, let's think about that for a moment. It is a body that enables us to enjoy the sensory experiences of sight, sound, taste, smell, and touch. When Christ comes again, our, our, our lowly bodies will be transformed like his glorious body. And what this means is that all the good and godly pleasures, all the good and godly pleasures of sight, sound, taste, smell, and touch will not be discarded when we enter eternal life, but they will be completely sanctified and infinitely enhanced. Our sight, taste, smell, touch, sound will not be discarded. It will be 
completely sanctified and infinitely enhanced. A rose in eternity will be infinitely more beautiful than anything we have seen here. The music in heaven will delight our hearts more than anything we have heard here. The sweet aromas of heaven, the scents of heaven will be far more pleasing than any scent here on earth. The taste of the food at the wedding supper of the Lamb will be infinitely more delicious than any meal we have here on earth. The touch and the embrace and, and the embrace of a loved one in heaven will be infinitely more tender than any embrace we have experienced here. So all the good and godly pleasures of sight, sound, taste, smell, and touch will be completely sanctified and infinitely enhanced. But here's the beauty, and yet, and yet all of these infinite pleasures will, will fade into utter insignificance as we enter the cosmic joy of a perfect and complete union with Christ Jesus. Think about it. All our pleasures infinitely enhanced, but all those infinitely enhanced pleasures fading into insignificance in the light of our glorious and blissful union with Christ Jesus himself. This is the beauty of the glorified state of the salvation of our bodies. Every pleasure we know will be infinitely greater, but more than any of this, our eyes will long to grace, gaze at Christ alone. Our ears long to hear his voice alone. Our mouths will long to feast on Christ alone. And our bodies will long to be in his arms alone. Verse 20. But our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. The word await here is, is captured better in another verse from Hebrews, which, which uses the same word in the, in the original Greek. Uh, I'm not going, going to bore you with the Greek, but let me just read this verse uh, from Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who eagerly wait for him. Eagerly waiting for him. So even as we enjoy all the good pleasures God has graciously given us, are we eagerly waiting for him? Is he the one makes your heart throb with excitement. Is Christ the one who makes your soul faint with longing? Is he the one, is Christ the one you love and worship more than anyone else? You see, our salvation must lead to a reordering of our desire. If you and I, if we are truly saved, if we are indeed regenerated by the Holy Spirit, our desires can never remain the same. Our desires can never remain the same. True salvation will lead to a reordering of our desires. Allow me to close with the words of C.S. Lewis from his very famous sermon, The Weight of glory. If we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the Gospels, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling apart with drink and sex and ambition when in 
finite joy is offered to us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. C.S. Lewis goes on to conclude, we are far too easily pleased. We are far too easily pleased. Spirit of God, would you awaken our hearts to knowing, loving, cherishing, and feasting on Christ for the day? Yes. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Thank you, Lord, for warning us yet again of the dangers of, and, and how legalism and licentiousness kills our joy. And Lord, we want to be honest and repent, say, Lord, we've been licentious in so many ways, and only you can rescue us, only you can save us. So help us, Lord, be transformed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.